every time we come to the Word of God, we have to realize that it is the Word of God. We have to realize that it is the Word of God. I mean, you know, it, it's kind of like we, we, we do things automatically. But if all of a sudden, next Sunday, God made an appointment to be here in person and read for you and I, which will be the next passage, Revelation 13, would it be different next week than it is today? That's a big problem on our part, isn't it? Well, we'd sit up, we'd take notice, and we'd listen. Because why? Because God's speaking. You know what subliminally we're suggesting? That, in fact, when the Bible is read and you read it, it's not the same thing as if God's saying it. That is a problem on our part, because it is God saying it. And we need to take the Word of God with such seriousness. Man shall not live by bread alone. What's the rest of it? But by every word that comes out of his mouth. So if you would, if you feel comfortable standing, we'll read Revelation 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his <coughs> head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled in the wilderness where she, was, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, and the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the world, he was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers have been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to heaven, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the, man, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. The servant poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, we come to a passage of scripture that has many perplexing details. Images, um, shapes, descriptions, numbers that can be easily befuddling to us. But I pray that, Lord, you would grant to us ears to hear what you have to say. There is a profound and significant intention on your part for us from this passage. And I pray that each of us 
would spiritually be on the edge of our seat to hear what you have to say, not to hear what I have to say. That you would prepare each of our hearts to embrace fully the Word of God and that you would direct my words, my mouth, and the ears of all your people so that we would come away with what you have in your Word for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible relates the hard and harsh history of Christianity through the years. Tribulation, affliction, persecution, hatred, exile, mockery are just some of the words used in the New Testament to describe what a lot of believers would be. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Okay, First Peter, think it not strange when you fall into various diverse troubles and, and temptations. It just, the very fabric of the New Testament presupposes the reality of hardship, doesn't it? In fact, Jesus in, in the gospel said, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. And, and to what extent did the world go in hating Jesus? How far did they go? They killed him. So, should we be surprised if, they have, if, if the world has murderous intentions toward us? Jesus said, don't, don't be shocked. Don't, don't, don't think this to be a strange thing. First Peter 1 says, in fact, Peter says that the trying of your patience, the trying of your faith, that is, the, 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 it comes against you, the hardship, the accusations, the lies, whatever it is comes against you because of your faith, it demonstrates that your faith is real. And therefore, that trial, Peter says, is itself extremely precious. In fact, more precious than gold. Because you know what? What does gold do? It perishes. You, you can't take it with you. But trials and tribulations come along and they demonstrate the validity and the reality of our faith. And that is in great encouragement because that faith perseveres to the end. It is assumed, as I said, that most Christians in the past have operated under this principle. Uh, a friend of mine was preaching, and part of the sermon he uh, preached, he uh, quoted and referenced several incidences out of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I would not say that it is grotesque but it is it just describes what took place and afterwards several people came up to him and said I, I wish you wouldn't have done that it bothered me and you think why well here's the little dirty secret we for really in a sense from the founding of our country have been the Christianity has been in a some sense in a in a privileged position wouldn't you say it's been in a privileged position. Um, forefathers, I mean, you know, you know, just wherever you see. Of late, however, things have radically changed and are changing so rapidly that we can't even recognize them. We have been trained, if you will, to accept and, and, and the normal as Christianity being at least accepted or not repudiated. But those times have changed, rapidly so. The present state of the church in America is the notion that we are shot by the possibility of persecution. One of the reasons I'm going through the book of Revelation is for us to come to the realization and recognition that persecution is not a possibility. It's not merely a probability. It's a certainty. And how are we going to respond? How are we going to act? Because the book of Revelation was written by John from an island on Patmos, which is almost nothing, to seven churches. And these seven churches were in a real situation, a real world predicament. And we went through all that. And you, and you see behind the, the backdrop of all of this is, is living out the Christian life bearing witness to Christ in a world that doesn't want to hear. And it's going to, as we shall see, it gets even worse than that. So John wrote to these people of the future, 
and what's going to transpire and how it all ends, listen, with the intention of preparing us for our present. This is not merely for us to, to just sit in our, our theological rocking chair and, and, and contemplate the future and figure out all the specific details, but rather to understand and comprehend what God's future holds and how it shapes our present. Um, I said this before, and in, in, in many sense, the future, as we will see, is, is a true and real and concrete occurrence. But it has repercussions or echoes or the future in episodes bleed into the present. So what we will see as we look in this chapter and others, things that will take place during especially the last three and a half years, which is often called the Great Tribulation. But there are things that are reflective today of that. But in order to do that, we're going to look at this chapter under three headings. The two signs in heaven, war arises in heaven and Satan is cast down to the earth and Satan renews his attack. Now the interesting thing here is that up to this point you've seen principally expounded and explained the wrath of God poured out on man. And it's frightening. Seven, the seven seals, we went through the seven trumpets. In a while we'll get to the seven uh, bowls or you know, uh, of plagues. But there is this emphasis that the wrath of God is coming. The, in the Old Testament, it was called the day of the Lord. And it was the day that was uniquely His. It was a day of darkness, a day of gloom, because God, if in a sense, was going to with, withdraw much of the mercy He shows and in His place give to man more of what they deserve. And that's where we see two things. One, they look at the rocks, and what do they do? They call on the rocks to do what? Fall on them and hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then later on we read about where, where all these things take place and it said, though all these things took place, they did not repent of their idolatries and then it did not repent of their sins. That's, even though as God's pouring out his wrath and his, and his judgment, his just judgment of this world, essentially man is saying, no, no, no being steadfast and stubborn in their rebellion. But there's also another theme that works itself and becomes in more and more intense, beginning, I think, in chapter 11 and working its way through, and that is not only do we see the wrath of God against this world, but we see the rage of Satan directed against God's people. I think you can probably feel, figure out why I picked the songs I did, especially... Um, a mighty fortress is our God. Because who did, battle, who did Martin Luther battle? The devil. Well, Catholic Church, but essentially he battled Satan. There is, uh, in Witten, I don't know, was it Wittenberg? You know, supposedly Satan appeared to him and he threw an inkwell at him. That's, you know. the, the point, though, is there was clearly a constant battling of Satan's foes. And we see that. We see that beginning to happen here in this book. It's, 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 not, it's not going off the topic of God's wrath, but we're seeing now more of a focus on Satan's rage directed, yes, at the world, we'll see that, but very specifically at believers. And we will come to that conclusion. So two signs in heaven beginning here. Now I'm going to say something right off the bat. This is a very confusing chapter in the sense that how much do you take literal? Okay? How, how, honestly, you read this, you take literal, okay? So everybody says, we're going to take it literal, okay? So you got a woman in heaven. Okay, just for, who's the woman? Polly. Where's the woman? And where is she, and where is she going to give birth? Go through here, and I can show you about 30 things that you can't take literal. Okay, this woman isn't floating in, heaven, in space to give birth to a baby. There are all sorts of situations and, and things in here that make it difficult. What I want us to do is not to get bogged down by the details. I was going to do this, didn't have time. I was going to make a sign that says danger. 
Okay? I'm going to hold it back here. But what I was going to do is make the words, um, all the letters, and I was going to make each letter, uh, f fill it up with the letter P, for example. Now, at this distance, could you see the P? No, because there would be hundreds of P's on each letter. But what could you see? You could see the word what? Danger. Now, what I want us to do is not, you know, it's not that we ignore the details, but sometimes, I think many times, the details become preoccupied. So all of a sudden, you get this, and, and, and you take this piece of paper, and you look at it, and it goes, well, all, this, this letter is full of all these letter P's. And you know what, this close, what don't you see? You don't see the big picture. And I want first to find the big picture, okay? Then we can look at the details instead of the other way. When I was at Dick and Connie's, uh, Neil and I were me, uh, lunch last week, they had this big, huge puzzle, okay? Big, huge puzzle. And what was immediately in, in proximity of that puzzle? The picture, why? Could you put the pieces, could you put it together without knowing what the picture was? Okay, the thing that we have to do is when we come, I really believe, to the book of Revelation is to see the big picture, then see how the details fit in. Okay? Now, let's go through some of these things. It says that, that there are two signs. I'll tell you what a sign. Where, is it, where does this take place at? Which itself is interesting. It takes place in heaven, right? And let me give you, where does she flee? On where? Okay, which is it? <laughs> but the point, though, is this takes place in heaven. Now, when you think of heaven, what do you immediately think of? Peace. Peace? Peace? Okay. You think of the abode of God, right? And that's, that's a common thing. Whenever we think, you know, somebody dies and goes to heaven, right? That's just our thinking. So when we think and read that there is this, these two signs that take place in heaven, we immediately conclude what? It takes place in the abode of God. The problem with that is, in the beginning, God created, okay, the heavens and the earth, right? Did God create his house? When it says God created the heavens and the earth, what does it mean? He, he created everything and when it's used in that context he's talking essentially about the sky space the atmosphere not the abode of god now that's very helpful to understand this because what's taking place here is not so much a battle that is actually taking place on the streets of heaven where god abode uh, where god abides but rather in the abode and place where satan's dominance occurs in, in ephesians 2 he is called the prince of the power, what? Of the air. This is a depiction of something profoundly spiritual and profoundly real. Using some really shocking and profound pictures. But what takes place here is we see these two events taking place. The woman giving birth and the serpent coming up as we will see to swallow up the woman I mean, swallow up the child that's born. All of this is a picture or or, 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 uh, of, of Satan's domain. The woman is giving birth in Satan's domain. Here's Satan exercising his domain. And, 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 and what's going on? Okay, this is, think about way back when, immediately after the fall, there was a famous prophecy. The very, if you will, it's the very first prophecy of Jesus. And what does it depict for us? Just put in your own words. What does it depict in Genesis 3.15? And the serpent. Yeah, so just not even using those words, what is, what is that depicting? A battle. The battle between the seed of the woman and Satan's seed, or Satan himself, right? That, and, and, in fact, from that point on, isn't that, in a sense, the description of what takes place in human history? A battle. A spiritual battle. 
a physical battle that, because Paul says, remember, and he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but what? Spiritual wickedness in high places. In, in, in Ephesians, talks about in, in heavenly places, in, in these abodes. So what you see here in the big picture is a depiction of Genesis 3.15, a fight. Satan's ultimate desire is to destroy the incarnate Christ. Can Satan destroy God? Absolutely not. His, there's no thought process on his part that he could destroy the Son of God. He wasn't after destroying the Son of God pre-incarnate. He was after destroying the incarnation of the Son of God. Because in this picture, the child is being born, okay? And the child is described as one who what? What will he do? He's going to rule the world. Now, the point is this. This whole thing takes place in whose realm? Satan's. And all of a sudden, this child's going to come, and whose kingdom is the child going to rule? His. Do you think he's really happy with that? No. What's happening here is this cosmic collision. It's coming to a conclusion. Throughout all human history, you've seen examples and evidences of this. It just also, but now it's coming to a conclusion where Satan is coming to his end, as, it, as we have read this morning. He knows his time is short. So this battle goes on, and Satan wants with all of his heart to destroy this child because God created the universe, God created the world to be ruled by whom? No, by man. Did he not? This was, this was his whole purpose. Yeah. His whole purpose was to create this world and to make man his vice regents so that man would... Yeah, exactly. So this whole world would be perfect and rule under the auspices of God and that the kingdom of God and the rule of God and the, and the sanctuary of God would expand everything and we would, be the, we would be blessed to execute that with no opposition from the world. Well, Satan came and says, I got a better plan. And what, who man aligned with Satan against God? Now, God's going to set all things right. And there has to be a man rule this world. And that man is Jesus Christ. Satan said, no, no, I've got to kill him. <laughs> now, you think about it. Think about what, what Satan did. Okay, the, the baby's born, right? And Herod finds out about it, and he goes, Herod says, oh, I want to worship Jesus. I want to worship the newborn king. <laughs> no, what? but Herod said that, didn't he? So he called the wise men, and the wise men, you know, he said, oh, please tell me, where will he be born? Yeah, where will he be born? Oh, they told him where? Bethlehem. And so he sends his soldiers to do what? Okay. And, and it says there, Rachel mourns for her children. I mean, a bloodbath. You know what? Did he care about how many he killed? All he wanted to do was what? kill the one. And if he had to kill a thousand or two thousand or however many, did he care? And you've got to get that in your mind. Satan has no care whatsoever about what carnage he um, enacts. He has no concern about collateral damage. In fact, he loves it. Now, he comes and tries to destroy the child. Okay, not only that, okay, you've got that. And then he couldn't kill him. So ultimately at that point, so then ultimately he works his way through. Then, then at the end, how many times do they want to stone him? Remember that? He's, he's, he speaks something, they pick up stones and stone him, and he, by, by miracle, leaves their presence. He, you know, because Jesus said, my time has not come. My time has not yet come. Finally, what does uh, Satan do to Judas? To do what? To betray him, right? To do what? So that he'd be exiled? Yeah. Satan's plan was to destroy, to devour the child. Now, what's really interesting here, the child's born, and nothing else except that the child now is caught up into heaven. At where? Not only the presence of God, but at his throne. Satan's 
biggest attempt to circumvent and destroy the plan of God actually accomplished it. Where did Jesus end up? On the throne. So you see this. This is the picture, the big picture. There's details that I, I, I know are confusing. And, and, and I mean, we can work through them, but I want the big picture. You see this. Here is this fight. And it's centered on Satan's desire to consume the incarnate Son of God. To destroy him. And it doesn't work. Now, for three days he thinks it does, doesn't he? I, I just can't imagine the party, if you will, that Satan was, was engaged in after having slain the Son of God, or Jesus, I should say. And then all of a sudden, the message comes that Jesus is raised from the dead. Oh, that's, that's not good. <laughs> so, you see this battle going on in heaven. Satan's there. He, he's pictured as this, this ferocious red dragon with uh, all these these accoutrements you got the ten horn you got the, the the seven heads the ten horns the t the seven crowns I mean it's a a, a frightening and, dis and and disturbing picture his tail sweeps down and the picture is you cannot think in this realm of one more powerful and more destructive than the red dragon is there any equal to Satan in this world is there anywhere close if we could sum up and take the whole of humanity and, and, and have them oppose Satan, would it be effective? Absolutely not. So Satan, he's, he's ruling. And he says, now my day comes. I'm going to wipe out this, this, uh, this, this son. I'm, I'm going to consume him. I'm going to swallow him up. I'm going to take him in. And that will be the end of it. But... God has different plans, and the child is escorted and caught up into heaven, and the woman is protected. Now, the second point, how does Satan respond to this? Because this is a transition. At this point, Satan has had free course in this world, demonstrated by his authority to rule, if you will, from this heaven, this atmosphere. Now what happens? Chapter uh, beginning in verse 7. Now war arose in heaven... Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. And, we're to, and, and I want you to understand, this is, this is fought on whose turf? Satan's turf. This is not in heaven, heaven, but this is fought in Satan's turf. You know, because he's out and about. Um, the, the theologian says that Satan is you, potentially ubiquitous. Big word, but basically means that he can be in a lot of places, apparently. Seem, that's a good word, seemingly everywhere. Now, he can't be. He's a creature like you and I. He's got limitations. But he has, d does he have helpers? What does this text say? He's got angels. Think, think about the angels in the Old Testament. Um, remember when, was it the Assyrians or Syrians that an angel killed? 185,000 of them? Was it Syrians? Okay, just one angel. That's it. So Satan is very powerful, and he has this whole cadre of, 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 of angels that are on his side. And so here comes a war, a battle. It doesn't go well with Satan, does it? What happens? He's cast out. He's defeated. If you will, he's kicked off his throne, and now... He's cast onto the earth. Now, he's, he's identified here in various terms. He's the ancient serpent. So clearly, we know where that language brings our minds to, Genesis 3.15. And you think about it. What was, what was Satan's ploy or plot when he slithered into the garden and talked to Eve and then Adam? What was he trying to do? Rule. Rule, okay. And, and he wanted to rule, huh? And how was he going to do it? He was going to get Adam to sign, the, if you will, to sign on the dotted line. To, to align with, to treaty with Satan. And, and that's exactly what Adam did. He wanted to be like God. So he's the serpent, the subtle one, sneaky. The devil, the accuser, Satan, the adversary. And he says, the deceiver of the world. I mean... One of the things that is so frustrating is how 
easily and without any remorse, politicians and um, people that are supposed to be giving us the news have no qualms about lying. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I feel real uncomfortable to lie. I mean, it, it, I mean, I can't do it because I'm just not good at it. I mean, not that I got a whole bunch of sins, but if I lied to you, you'd say, he's lying, <laughs> because it would be that obvious, okay? These people, politicians and, and, and media stars, uh, lying is, as it says, of Satan, it's his, natu- it's his native tongue. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it, I, I listen, and, and you watch these people talk, and you go, wait a minute, this is not true. It's obviously, it's patently not true. But do they care? And in fact, they believe their own lies. They're convinced that what they're saying is absolutely true, without a hesitation, without a doubt. And why? Because who's operating the whole world in the backdrop? Satan. And his big thing is deception, deceiving, and being deceived. Now, Satan is cast down. This is a humiliation. This is, when it talks about, and it was Isaiah, it says that those in hell will look down, and is this the one who caused so much grief on earth? In Colossians 2, it says, He put to open shame the principalities of the air at the cross. Yeah. This is a humiliation, not the last one, mind you, but this is a big humiliation of Satan. You are no longer going to have the free reign you had before. You're not going to be able to just cruise around, if you will, in the air. You are going to be kicked off and you're going to be cast down to this world where you belong. Now, there is a celebration, a proclamation of victory that has two points. One, there's jo- the joy of the heavens. Notice there's a change. It says in verse, uh, let's see if we can find it real quick. Uh, in verse 12, it says, therefore rejoice what? Oh, heavens. That's, now he's talking about the abode of God. In heavens, in the place of the abode of God, there's going to be such joy at this occasion. I mean, it's like you watch a movie, and, 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 and part of movies are this tension. You know, you have the, the, the protagonist and the antagonist and going back and forth. It always looks like the bad guy's going to win, right? And then, you know, you say, there's no way, there's no way. And then finally, the bad guy loses, you know? And what do you feel? Yay! I remember this one. I can't remember anything about the movie. But there was this real, real bad guy. And it looked like he was going to get away with it. Okay? And this is one of those movies that it totally doesn't make any sense. Well, this one guy was going to get giddy. And so he was chasing him down with a car. And the guy started going up these big set of stairs, and the guy drove after him with the car and finally pinned him against a wall. Now, he's like, yes, because this guy was really, really bad. And there's this elation because there's a sense of justice. Well, in a sense, you know what heaven's going to be like when Satan is cast down? in elation, a joy. And you see it here. Let me read this again. It says in verse 10, and I heard a, vo- a loud voice in heaven. And it's, I think this loud voice is one of the redeemed, perhaps a martyr, because he talks about our brothers. He says, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren, brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Now, it's really interesting. You know, you know what the devil does? Is he, how is he described here in regard to you and I? What does he do day and night? Accuses. How does he accuse? Yeah, but to whom? To God. Say, hey, God, let me give you a list of the stuff that Gary has done. Right? And he's, he just does that incessantly. And I'm sure the saints have been saying, God, why do you put up with this? There's a reason. But I think of, of Romans 8. Satan, blah, 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 blah. Right? What does Romans 8 say? Who can lay a charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. All that Satan can do is accuse 
bah, 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 bah. The, the Puritans say this, well, he doesn't even get the list right. He doesn't get it complete. But it's okay because of, of what Christ has done for us. So there is this, there is this joy, salvation, and power, and, and the kingdom of God has come. Why? Because of the exercise of Christ's authority as the God-man in this world. Everything in the book of Revelation is about the executing of God's plan through the hand of Jesus Christ. When we see in, in chapter 4 and 5, there was one sitting on the throne. We know that's the Father. And what was in his right hand? A scroll. It was the execution of God's perfect plan. Who alone was worthy to take and to open the seals, to execute God's plan? The Lamb. The Lamb as though he were slain and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Correct? So, heaven rejoices. And we're going to get to verse 10 in a, uh, in a minute, so I won't pause on that. So there is this great celebration in heaven, but there is misery for the earth. Notice heaven, verse 12, it says, Heavens rejoice, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you ticked off. He is furious. He has just been dethroned. He, his time is about to come to a conclusion. And he does not take it well. He is absolutely furious. And the voice from heaven says to earth, woe. It's going to be a horrible time. Does Satan, after his defeat, does he surrender? Absolutely not. Rather, he intensifies his campaign of destruction and carnage. All that Satan knows is destruction and murder. If you could take a, a spiritual electron microscope and scan the being Satan, you will find nothing good at all. Not a particle. Nothing. He is often described as the evil one. The, 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 the sum total of the evil one. And, and a lot of moderns says, ah, he doesn't exist. Oh, but he does exist in the, the scriptures. So now, what we find in the last section is Satan renews his attack. He's thrown down to earth, and now he lashes out at the woman. He can't get the sun. The sun is beyond, right? The sun's caught up into heaven, sitting at the throne, exercising his authority. What we find here, in, in really interesting language, the, 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 the wings of an eagle, uh, the, the water that comes out of Satan's mouth, the earth swallows it up. This woman's protected by God, right? Now, I think, and I just this really quickly, because all of it's coming and focusing in on what takes place and what he's saying in verse 17. Then the dragon became furious with the woman because he couldn't touch her, could he? So what was his response? Went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. You'll see this filled out more in chapter 13. We know of no fury like Satan's. Every step of the way, he has failed, hasn't he? Every step of the way, here's Satan. He says, I'm going to devour the child. Did that work? He says, along the way, he says, oh, I'm, going to, I'm going to get... Whatever Satan's ploy or, or, or scheme was to destroy the Christ didn't work. And when he, in fact, thought he did, the very thing that Satan used to, what he thinks, to destroy the Christ actually brought about our salvation in the resurrection. So he can't get to Christ. Ultimately, he can't get to the woman because who's protecting her? God. So, who can he get to? Who can he get to? 
the other offspring. And it says that he decides to sit down and, and talk with them in, in, in very kind words. Have a parlay, a dialogue. That's a new word. You know, everybody's going to have a dialogue. What language does he see? Do you see there? He went off to do what? Make war on the rest of her offspring. And, he just, and the offspring are described as how or who? Two things. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of or about Jesus. The offspring of the woman are those people who are serious about Christ. Verbally serious. The word, the testimony of, of Christ or the witness of Christ are these people, we'll see in a minute, who are unashamedly forthwith, forthright proclaimers of Jesus. I was listening this morning uh, by a message by R.C. Sproul. He was in English class, and, and the, the English teacher was a correspondent during World War II, so this was dated. And she was one of those people that believed there was multiple ways to go to heaven. And so I don't know how she found out, but it was always her, her thing. If she found a Christian in, the, in, the, in her classroom, that she would attack him. So he says, R.C., see, do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Now, you're in a class of a couple, maybe 100, 200 people. You know what's going to happen. you got two options. What are the two options? Yeah, yes or no? If you say yes, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to come against you. The teacher is going to rail on you. If you say no, you've just committed treason, right? So he goes, yes. What would you say? Because he kind of muttered. He said, yes. And then for the rest of the class, she be team, be, be, uh, proceeded to just rake him over the coals for such arrogance. Okay? Who's behind that? Satan. Satan is after God's people, going and, and destroying and attacking it and making war. And, and that's just an example. It is going to be, in fact, I'll, I'll read it in a minute, but it is going to be so intense that had God not shortened the days of this great tribulation, what would be true? No one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, the days are shortened. So, this war, which we will see really fleshed out in the next chapter, is indeed over the world at large with special emphasis on God's people. There is a hatred on his part. You know the thing that, that you can kind of see this? Here's a Christian baker, just makes cakes. What in the world does it bother a gay couple that he's baking cakes? I mean, how does that disturb them? How does that alter their life in any really meaningful way? Does it? Well, I mean, you can get cakes a thousand places. But, but the thing is, why go to a person where you know that that's their religious person? Who cares? They're motivated by malicious hatred. There was a professor or a lecturer or something at Harvard, and she goes, I know this is probably not going to be popular, but there are only two sexes, there's male and female. It's just, that's biology. And the Harvard professor of diversity and all this stuff said, oh, that's the most hateful language you could ever imagine. Okay, it's not, okay, let's just disagree. There is vitriol. There is hatred. There is animosity that seems, and it not seems, that is totally inappropriate. Just because you have a different view, does that mean you're going to spit in my face? and destroy me. But that's why. What, where does that come from? It comes from Satan. You, if I get on a college campus and just start, you know, just give the gospel, instead of people just walking by and ignoring it, what's going to certainly happen sooner or later? In your face. And it's not going to say, well, I disagree with you. Could we have a discussion? No. I remember this is, this is the, the closest thing I ever came to physical persecution. It was down South Carolina, and we were giving out tracts and stuff, and there was one guy, and he was, I probably shouldn't have talked to him because he was drunk. And I gave him a track and started talking to him, and, and I, out of the corner of, my, corner of my eye, I saw his fist like this. I go, oh, this is going to hurt. <laughs> you know, and he, he just, you know, his knuckles got white, and he was going to punch me. Well, fortunately, God intervened at the time, but it, it, was, it was a kind of a, you know, 
know, disturbing thing. So Satan is going to make war. Now, what is interesting is how many times we've seen, and we will see that different ways it's expressed, a time, times, times, and a half a time, or 42 months, or 1,260 uh, days, or um, 42 months. I mean, it's all over the place, right? Now, you know what? That is what's called, what is it called? The last half of the tribulation is called what? The Great Tribulation. This is where it gets really, 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 really bad. Now, that in itself is a mercy in the fact that God will only allow it to go for three and a half years. It will be limited, but it will be horrific. Now, it's really interesting, and then I'll make the conclusions. The very last um, verse, the very last sentence, it says, and he stood on the sand of the sea. Now, if you have a King James, you, you're going to see it. It's based on a different uh, text. But basically, and he stood on the sand of the sea is reference to Satan. Because what takes place in chapter 13? You know what happens? Who comes, what comes out of the sea? The beast. You know what this means? This is Satan's ultimate warrior against the world, but especially against God's people. This is the, I mean, you can't get more vicious, more slanderous, and we'll get to that. Just in your face, this is, in a sense, Satan's equivalent to Christ. We call him what? The Antichrist. We'll get to that. The, the word anti can mean two things. Against or what? In place of. So he will come and, and, and be presented as the substitute, but this is all his plan to unleash his fury on the world. And you think, now, now get this, how strange is it? The world are his servants, right? You know what Satan loves to do with his servants? Destroy them. Murder them. Take from them. Ruin them. Now, that seems strange, doesn't it? For, for, you know, if, that, if these are your servants, you, you want to kind of keep them alive for a while. But it's his nature to do evil. But the focus of his hatred is on, on the saints. Now, I've got a couple things I want, three things to conclude in light of this. The first one you probably won't want to hear, but it's true. You can't escape it. You're hated. You are hated. Does anybody want to be hated? I mean, that's not a, that's not a fun thing, is it? Well, that's true, yeah. But I mean, but generally speaking, that's not what we, you know, you know what are we going to do when you grow up? I want to be hated. I mean, in fact, what do we do? We avoid confrontations. We don't want to be hated, right? <clears throat> but one thing we can take from this and other portions of, of the Scripture, especially the book of Revelation, is that Satan hates you without limit. <clears throat> You cannot come up with a compromise. The reason he hates you, if you're a Christian, is that you have been joined and united to Jesus such that there is really no distinguishing between Christ and you so that since Satan can't get Christ, he can't devour the Christ child who is he going to go after? Now, that's going to take place in the Great Tribulation when all this unfolds. But mind you, there are repercussions of that right now. And I'm, what's scary, and I'm being honest, I, and this, this is really helpful. My life has been easy in regard to persecution and difficulty. I haven't had much. I'm accustomed to a comfortable life. I'm not accustomed for people getting just the guy who's going to punch me in the face. I've talked to people, and, and the worst thing is I've had a door or two slammed in my face. But generally, not like, I mean, your face, and you know, who wants that? But the Bible makes clear that Satan hates Christ 
and all who are Christ's. And since Christ is beyond the consumption of Satan, never could, he was delusional, there are those who he can get to. Now, here's a, a problem that you're going to pose. We're going to answer this. Why in the world would, would our Lord and Savior, who purchased us with his own blood, permit us to be the objects of his fury, such that we will, some will even die? Now, we're going to get to that. But it's, it's, it's meant for us to wonder, why in the world would, would he send us out as, sh as sheep among wolves? Why, in chapter, the next chapter, it says it is granted, it was granted to him, it was given to him by the authority of Christ to make war on whom? The saints. They go, hmm, excuse me, could we change that plan? I mean, I would be like Aaron, excuse me, <laughs> hello, you see my hand? <laughs> I want to change this plan. Because I'm a coward. I mean, I don't have any strength in me. And, you know, like, oh, I, I mean, it's like, I don't want Satan to know my name. I don't want Satan to know anything about me. You know what I'm saying? I want off the radar. It's kind of like, okay, you know, you, you know we, we publish the sermons, you know, on YouTube. Oh, you, you kind of think, is that really a smart thing to do? <laughs> you know, what, what happened? You know, like that type of thing. Well, Satan hates all who are in Christ because he so despises Christ. And you have to realize, come to the terms, you're hated for sake. Second point, you are in an unavoidable war. You can't flee or hide. There's no way away from it. There's no escape. <coughs> There's no Switzerland. There's no neutral territory. Paul makes that clear at the end of Ephesians because after having talked about the principalities and powers, he makes the point that he commands us to do what? The last beginning, ch uh, chapter 6, verse 10. What are we to do? He commands us to do what? Wherefore, take, take up the whole armor of God. You're in battle, folks, and there's a wonderful statement that reappears in different ways. The, the aim and the purpose of the armor of God is that we might stand and having done all, stand. It's withstanding the attacks of the devil. The armor that God gives us is perfectly matched to Satan's attack. Isn't that wonderful? Perfectly matched. It says, we have the shield of faith whereby we can... Sorry, God. So in other words, God says, you're in a battle. You can't get out of the battle. But I have given you everything you need for the battle. Now, again, I'm... It's kind of like, I remember when it was um, my senior year, <laughs> they were still having the draft lottery. You know, it's like, wow, you're know, you going know, to get money? No, you have to go to Vietnam. Bob, did you get drafted or did you volunteer? Uh, I had, I think, a month to choose whether you going in the Army or the Okay, but you got, you got, the, you got the lottery. He got the number, you know, and you didn't get any money. Well, I remember going down, and, and, and it was lottery time, you know, and the, the, by the time I was there, the war was, you know, you know, you know going down. But I can still remember the, the gulp I felt when, you know, when the lottery was being held, and, you know, fortunately, my number wasn't, wasn't called. You know, like, oh, I'm so glad about that. I didn't want to go there. And you know what happened during a lot of times? There's a lot of people that fled the United States to go to Canada. They didn't want to fight in the war. They wanted to avoid it. This war is unavoidable. You say, well, and, and nowadays, you know, if you're old, you don't go to service, do you? If there was a war right now, none of us would get drafted, would we? And, and, and at least, and, and, well, they, they may change it, but also, if you're beyond, beyond, younger than a certain age, you won't get drafted. You have to be, right now in America, you have to be a man. Now, the question is, what's that anymore? Okay. So, for most people, it's avoidable, but not this war. It doesn't make a difference whether you're old or young, male or female. If you're a Christian, you're in a war. Satan hates you, and it's unavoidable. And the last point, and this, is, this goes, takes us back to verse 10, you and I are to prevail. If you would go back to verse 10. 
well, excuse me, verse 11. He's talking about the heavens rejoicing, the kingdom, the power, salvation to come through the uh, uh, work of Christ on the cross. And the defeat of the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. How did they prevail? Verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. First point. How do we prevail? We prevail not by our righteousnesses, not by our religious successes. We don't match our purity against Satan's depravity. We don't match power to power. The fundamental foundational reason that Christians are to prevail, listen folks, is the complete and the perfect work of Christ for our salvation. Is anything lacking? Did Christ leave anything for us to do? You know what religion does? What, you know, people say this. Christianity is what, we, what God does for us. What is religion? What we do for God. Now, you know what Satan wants? He wants us to come into, his, into this conflict with that notion, what we do for God. And then he chops it up and destroys it. Luther, before his conversion, was haunted and, and, and came to the point where he actually hated God. You know why he hated God? Because he misunderstood what God's saying. In, in <coughs> so the good news is the righteousness of God. How is that good news? It's kind of like you, you go and you, you, you commit a crime, and you're going and you hear that the judge follows the law to the letter, shows no mercy. Would that be good news to a criminal? Luther thought that's what it meant until he realized that what he's talking about is a righteousness that God accounts to us by faith that is the righteousness of his son based on the perfect work of Christ on the cross when he was buried and resurrected and ascended. So, so in other words, we come against Satan not with an incomplete slate, an unfinished thing. It's not like we come there and say, well, I've got... Nine things done. God did nine things for me. I'm going to do, I just got to do the, the last. Satan goes, this is going to be easy. We come into this fray, this battle, by the blood of the Lamb. Does, he, does his work lack anything? Okay, do you believe that? I mean, really believe that. There was a Puritan said this when Satan would have come and accuse him. You know what he'd say? He says, go talk to my heavenly husband. Take it up with him. It says in Colossians, having forgiven us most, our, most of our sins. Is that what it says? What does it say? Having forgiven us all. So when we are in this fray, Satan really does not have anything he can touch us. And, um, in the, the very last uh, chapter of 1 John, it says, Satan cannot what you? because he cannot touch you. He really can't make any accusation against you. He can't do anything to God's elect. That's the first thing. The, the sufficiency, the totality, the completion of the saving work of Christ. Complete, perfect, lacking nothing. And if you're not, if you're not really confident that you're saved solely by the work of God in Christ. You are going to, you're going to lose in the battle. You will lose. You can't not but lose. Secondly, by the word of their testimony. This is the verbalization of the gospel in the light of affliction. It's not only believing this, it's proclaiming it. You really know if somebody believes it, you proclaim it. Now understand something. In this context, to proclaim it means what? 
It's under duress. And the last thing it says, they valued something more than they valued their own lives. I said something about this on Thursday. We must see by the auspices and aid of the Holy Spirit the true beauty, value, worth of Jesus Christ in an experiential relationship so that we know Him. So that we see Him and we say, He is more valuable than my life. Now, unless we know Christ, unless we really know Him as He is through the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, I'm telling you seriously, there's no way in the world that you're going to stand up to die. Because you're going to love, you love what you treasure the most. And what this is all about, these people comprehend the work of the Lamb, and because the Spirit of God has opened their eyes to behold Christ in His glory and beauty, they treasure Him more than they treasure life itself. Now that's, I'll say this, that is part of the answer why God grants to Satan the, the, the privilege or the, the, the authority to make war on the saints. Something in our death and suffering says something about Jesus. Now, that's the hint of the solution. But these three things you have to realize. One, you're hated. Two, you are an unavoidable war. And three, you and I are to prevail. And we just looked at this. You can go to Ephesians 6. There's all sorts of places where we, we, you know, we are given instructions and help in this fight. But fight we are in. And it will not get any easier. We will not be spared because of our age or our gender. Satan doesn't care. He will come after us with fury and hatred and make war against us. And we saw in the last two, uh, where the last two witnesses, it says the beast um, made war against them and conquered them and killed them. And the world did what? Celebrate it. That's what's going to happen. When the world comes against us, Satan comes against us, and, and, and just attacks us. Don't expect the world to say, oh, that's too bad. Find the world will be applauding that. Now, I understand this is like, oh, I don't want this. I'm just telling you what's coming, what's reality. And, and one day this will come in its fullness, in its climax, in that great last half of the tribulation. But there are echoes and reflections of that now, and it's becoming even more so in our day and age. So as they succeeded in that time, so we will succeed in ours. Because, folks, we must stand up. We must prevail. We must conquer by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, for the glory of our Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I do pray that, Lord, your grace and mercy and, and kindness would be upon us. Lord, it is... It's no joyful thought to consider that we're hated and, and, and to be thinking that Satan is after us is a, a nightmarish thought. But it's true. We are engaged in a war. Satan purposes to make war against all the offspring of the woman. Just pray that, Lord, you would help us to be faithful, to take upon the whole armor of God so that we might stand and prevail to your glory and honor. For we do pray this in Christ's name.